again, it was printed on the program. Um, or it's in public, it's open. We will sing through that probably at least twice. So when we get to the end, just grab it. So at the beginning, it takes a while for you to get in here. And you can mark it on the call all the way down the hall. At the end of the service, if you would like to watch the benediction, the girls will recess into the quad and, um, and there the benediction will be given. And what you can do is leave the quad, leave, leave the building through the post office where it would be best rather than following the girls through the center of the building.
Please remain standing. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into the Lord's presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is God that made us, and we are God's. We are God's people, and the sheep of God's pasture. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving, and God's courts with praise. Give thanks to the Lord. Bless God's name. the tongues of mortals and of angels and have not love I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love I am nothing if I give away all I have and if I sacrifice my body so that I may boast but have not love I gain nothing Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or, bo jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For our knowledge is imperfect, and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I matured, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then face to face. Now I know only in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So faith, hope, love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you.
One of the long-standing graduation chapel traditions at Westover has been for the senior class to invite as speaker a qualified person who is a friend or relation of a graduating senior. This morning, I'm happy to say that that person is the Reverend Terrence Ryan. Terry has served churches in Milford, Connecticut, Big Timber, Montana, but more recently, for the past 30 years in fact, he has been the beloved senior pastor of the Sharon Congregational Church in Sharon, Connecticut, the church attended, by the way, by a graduating senior, Mary Kate Kosciuszko. Terry's wife, Linda, is the director of the Rudd Learning Center at Salisbury School. Terry is no stranger to Westover, as he and Linda are the parents of two Westover alumni, Olivia and Sierra, class of 2006. When Terry is not pastoring his congregation, he may be found during the summer captaining his sailboat Clementine off the coast of Maine. We are honored and delighted to welcome him as this morning's graduation chapel speaker. I would like to begin this morning by saying a very simple and sincere thank you to Mary Kate Kosciuszko uh, and to you, the members of the class of 2013 from Westover School, for inviting me to uh, speak here at your chapel. So let me just say that first. It is an honor. But secondly, and maybe more importantly, it's a surprise. <laughs> and I was at the end of a very long and very difficult road. And if it were not for the incredible generosity and kindness and courage of an amazing woman who gave me one of her kidneys, um, I would be, um, well, I wouldn't be here. And that day when she graduated, I was, as you may know the, the line from one of my favorite movies that the kids introduced me to, uh, from The Princess Bride, when, when uh, you wouldn't think so, but it is in fact one of my favorite movies. Um, Princess Bride, and, and, uh, and, and it's the line of Miracle Max examining the poor dead hero of the story and he looks at him and he says once he finds out that there's profit in it for him he looks at him and he says he's only mostly dead <laughs> and and at that point I was only mostly dead but I got that transplant and I was given a new life and it is an incredible gift to be given a life when your old one was just about gone so that's number one reason why I'm surprised. The second one was um, at Christmas time, uh, I had been already asked to, to speak at this uh, chapel service, and our two daughters were home for Christmas, and we were having a wonderful time together. And I mentioned to them that I had been invited to speak at the Westover uh, chapel service for commencement. And they looked at each other, and in unison, and in much these words said, oh dad, and you know when they say that, that's not a good thing, <laughs> oh dad, we never wanted you to speak at chapel. <laughs> and so it was another lesson in the great humility that we gain through parenting. <laughs> but I am not dead. And you invited me, and I am very thankful to be here with you this morning. Now, I am very aware of the incongruity of what I'm about to say, given what I have done throughout all of my life. And this is what I'm going to say. I don't care much for religion. <laughs> Weird, isn't it? 40 years being a pastor in churches and saying, I don't care much for religion. But you have to understand what I'm saying. I have found so much of religion to be so phony, so empty, so devoid of any authenticity, and often so filled with corruption that I am often just, uh, I'm put off by it. <laughs> but that is not to say, and this is very important, that is not to say that I do not have a deep and profound regard for the sacred. And the, the sacred 
often occurs when we are least anticipating it. It often occurs outside of a religious context. It occurs in the spirit, in the spirit of each of you and all of us. It occurs in time and it occurs in space. It occurs in us. And some, may, some people may religiously argue, and they do, that there is nothing sacred in this world any longer. And I would say to them, you are missing something incredible. You are missing the best part if you are missing the sacred in your lives because it's there. Now, when I was thinking about coming here and thinking about this chapel and, and um, thinking about what it was like for me the first time that I looked in the door back there, and then I got to thinking about it, what it was like for you. When you first got your tour of Westover School and you came and you looked in the chapel door, can you remember that day? Can you remember when you looked in the door and you thought, well, I'm not sure what you thought, but perhaps some of you thought, some of you undoubtedly thought, how boring. <laughs> and I'll bet some of you still think the exact same things <laughs> today. But I don't. Because if you recall what I just said, I believe that the sacred happens in people, it happens in moments, it happens in time, it happens in space, and for me, it has happened here in this chapel. Not because of religious sentiments, not at all. But because in this place, sacred words have been spoken. And if you've listened very carefully, you've heard them. And sacred moments have occurred when lives have been touched and changed, maybe a little, maybe a great deal. There have been sacred moments when lives were touched with love and with hope with dreams, with possibilities, and those are sacred moments. I remember two evenings, November 1999. Our older daughter Alyssa came to this school as a freshman in September of 1999, and it was the exact same time that Marla Truini came to be the new director of drama at Westover School, which was an amazing coup for Westover School. An amazing blessing for both of our daughters. And somehow, Marla saw something in Alyssa. And even as a freshman, she chose her to play the lead in Marla's first play here, which was The Crucible by Arthur Miller. And she asked Alyssa to play that part, the part of John Proctor. And if you know the play, if you're familiar with it, Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, is really a metaphor, a critical metaphor of the trials that were part of the American life back in the early 1950s that we call McCarthyism, a time of incredible repression, a time when fear was parroted into an embarrassment, a huge embarrassment to our history of accusation, of suspicion, of threat, of punishment, and ultimately for some of death. And Miller used the Salem witchcraft trials, another very dark period in American history, to tell his story. And the hero at the crucible was a man named John Proctor. And that was the part that Alyssa played. Her first opportunity to play a man, which you get to play a lot. Uh, if you're in the theater program at Westover, you may never have had that chance before, but turns out some of you women are incredible men. <laughs> and when Alyssa became John Proctor, she became John Proctor, and I kept looking at her and thinking, what happened to my little girl? What have you done to her? Hey, amazing is John Proctor. Crazy thing about McCarthyism or the crazy thing about that period of the witchcraft trials in America was that it made no sense. It was just insane. And, and what happened was that people were accused of being witches for all kinds of reasons that had nothing to do with religion. It really had nothing to do with witchcraft. It often had to do with the most base principles or basic instincts of human nature, of greed, of hatred, of bitterness, of suspicion but mostly a fear, a fear that could be built and built upon and drawn out and turned into terrible, terrible behaviors.
And so John Proctor was accused of being a witch, and he needed to do only one thing, to escape punishment and death. He only had to confess. And this is the insane part. If, if you were accused of being a witch, all you had to do was confess it, and you'd live. But if you were accused of being a witch and had nothing to do with witchcraft, and you said, no, I'm not a witch, then you were put to death. It's crazy. It's insane. It doesn't make any sense. And yet that was the way it was. He needed only confess, and he could have lived. And many of his friends and neighbors did confess in order to save their lives, to save themselves from hanging. In fact, in the very final scene, John Proctor does exactly that. He confesses because he wants to live. He just wants to live with his children. He wants to see his children grow up. He wants to live with his wife and love his wife. He just wants to live. And so he confesses and he says, I'm a witch. And then they say, now you have to sign a confession. You have to put your name on it. And, and we're going to nail it to the church house door. And it will be a witness to all the community that you have confessed that you are in fact a witch. And that would be his legacy, not only to that community, but to his family and to his children. And, and then something happens. When they say you have to sign your name, and that will be hung on the church house door. Something changes within the man and he begins to understand. He begins, you can begin to see the, the power of this thing that he's done, and he's about to do, affect him. And Proctor, our daughter Alyssa, is forced to sign a confession. And, and she signs that confession and as she signs it, that awareness, that consciousness begins to come into her, into him. And she realizes what she's doing, and he realizes what he's doing. And he takes up that document in his hand, and he crushes it. And then he tears it apart, and he says so loudly, he cries out, she cries out, I cannot! It is my name! I cannot! It is my name. It is the only name that I shall have in this life. I cannot! It is my name! And it was this exact spot 14 years ago that Alyssa said those words in the chapel. Right here where I'm standing now. And then the guards came and they took her and they dragged her off to be hanged. And I remember, and more importantly, she remembers. It's your name. It's your name. It's who you are. It's a reflection of your character. Your name is how you will be known in the world. Your name is how you will be remembered. It's your name. And perhaps you haven't treasured your name yet. Perhaps you haven't really thought about how important it is. But if you haven't treasured it yet, treasure it now. I hope and I pray that you will. Do not sacrifice it on the altar of popularity in life. Do not sacrifice it on the altar of safety in life. And do not offer it up to the tyrants of this world, large or tiny little tyrants, who would crush it and grind it beneath their feet into the dust. It is your name. Your mom and your dad gave you your name. They gave it to you because it was always meant to be your name. They have spoken it countless times. Can you think of it? Can you think of how many times your folks have said your name to you? How many times they have spoken it to you in love? How many times they've spoken it to you in, in compassion and caring? How many times they have spoken it to you in ex utter exasperation? How many times they have said, oh, will she ever get it? <laughs> 
but how many times that has been expressed to you over and over again. The voice of your parents calling your name rings in your hearts and it will ring in your hearts forever. And your vo the voices of your parents will someday be quieted because they will be gone from this earth. But their voices will never be gone from your hearts. You will hear it, hear them forever. I promise you that. And in a few moments, your parents who gave you your name are going to be out on the lawn in the quad and they're going to be and they're going to be listening for Rachel Bashevkin to to speak your name after four long years at Westover of study of living in a convent of, <laughs> of Saturday nights in a little bus of all those things that you have suffered and endured to become the women that you become, of all the ways that Westover School has protected you from the evils of wicked boys, <laughs> of all the times that I have said over the years, God, thank you I never had to shoot a single boy during, <laughs> during the high school years of my daughters. Thank you, God. But they will listen for Rachel Bashevkin to read your name, to call you up to get your diploma. And, and then when they hear your name, their hearts will soar with pride and with joy and love for all that you have accomplished. And it is so much for how hard you have worked for the young, incredible, beautiful women that you have become. And they will absolutely be at the very top of what it means to be a parent to be so proud, to be so much pleased with what you have done and what you are yet to do in the world. Listen to the name, listen to their voices, listen to the love in it, listen to that, listen to that that they have given you. Some people say there's nothing sacred in the world. That's not true. Your name is sacred. Your name is sacred. Keep it. Keep it. If there is anything pure, if there is anything holy, if there is anything good, it is your name.